Guidelines. There is only one way to get there. That law transcends our generational minds and haphazard hand-me-down memories. It is one of the few laws that the Everfolk obey. To access the heart of the jungle, you must travel along the river. The boat's enormous paddle wheel slapped inexorably through the water, creating a frothing churn of white foam in its wake. Howie had always loved to slink out behind the boiler room and watch the wheel since he was a boy. The noises of its chugging splashes were so loud that it seemed to eclipse all the other noises in life. On the quiet nights, when the engine was still, where the crew was on shore leave, how he could still hear it inside his head. A whistle sounded, and the wheel began to slow almost immediately, and Howie, readjusting his cap, knew what that meant. They were coming into the dock. She was called the Elysium, and Howie had walked her decks since he was a boy, swabbing them. Now as the first mate, he knew every inch of her, and few knew her task better. The captain of the Elysium, by law, could never be a river rat. Rather, they were an appointed official by the local government. It was a lofty position for a wanna. One of those posts in the world it was necessary for the Everfolk to place prestige on. How he found Captain Hicks stood by the staging point, watching as the lowerable deck was winched down to rest on the waiting dock as the Elysium came to a dead stop with perfectly timed precision. Her smile of satisfaction slipped as the Elysium tugged at the mooring ropes once as its weight caught up with it, just to prove that something always goes wrong. The staging deck scraped along the dock for a moment before settling down securely. Fortunately, none of the Everfolk had been ready to board, and so the minor mistake was easily ignored. Howie stood to attention next to the captain and waited. The ropes? She spoke out of the corner of her mouth. Secure? Howie replied barely keeping the scorn out of his voice. Be sure it doesn't happen again. Her fear-induced discipline shone through her words. She was terrified of being shown up. Aye, Captain. The luggage came first. It reminded Howie of the stories the old and jungle-rum-soaked river rats had told him when he was a boy. There had been a time when the Everfolk who chose to make the one-way trip had walked with bare feet towards their next life. The reverence for the trip remained, but the deference to the jungle was something only Wanners maintained. Those fellas had loved to spin yarns, smoke grass, and spit into the river they had plied their trade on. The water can do that to a Wanner. When something becomes your whole life, it's easy to start thinking that's all there is. How he recognised he wasn't far from that himself. He watched as valises, cases and trunks were marched down the dock and up the staging ramp by eager and well-dressed Wanner servants. Those men and women had technological devices clinging to their belts, necks and faces, never far from their hands or thoughts. Yet their lives were about to change beyond all reckoning, and on their faces the entire spectrum of that change was represented. How he saw some barely conceal their excited elation, Others went about their duties with sombre regret, but most seemed worried. Change can be a terrifying thing when your family line has worked for one of the Everfolk for generations. Within ten minutes, the fabulous carried wealth of their masters had been stowed within the opulent cabins of the Elysium, and those Wanners, not bound to the old steamship, had disembarked to live the rest of their lives. A distant chime sounded from within the white weatherboarded hotel that jutted out over the river beside the dock. How he waited next to Hicks, and after a moment, the Everfolk came down the dock. Their bodies were timeless in their perfection, and though their flesh bore the same shapes, sizes and colours of one or racial groups or body types, they all seemed somehow alike, having long ago reached the zenith of human potential on a subcosmic level. It seemed improbable to Howie that these people had ever lived and died as a Wanner does, and he wondered, as he always did, what it might feel like to hold the memories of an Everfolk, watching history unfold.
Captain Hicks fawned over them as their long strides brought them up the ramp onto the Elysium's deck, greeting each of them in turn with deference, but never daring to shake their hands. It was forbidden to touch another folk, unprompted. Howie logged each of them on the passenger manifest as they passed him without a glance. Then his eye caught on something he had never seen before. An ever-folk child, looking to be the equivalent of a one- or nine-year-old, was walking up the dock holding the hand of their parent. Captain, it's Towie, indicating the boy. Be quiet. I have read the manifest, replied Hicks with a close whisper. But the law says, the law does not say anything about this. It's only a guideline. Remove yourself from the prowl, as you have lost control of your voice. How he turned, and with as much dignity as he could gather together, gave the manifest over to the second mate before making his way up the crew stairwell to the pilot house. The Elysium was quadruple decked, and everything shone. The fresh painted railings, the polished brass fixtures, the varnished sealed wooden decks. Howie had thought that there was a purpose in that beyond luxury, that there was perhaps something holy in their task. Now, Howie wondered how much of that was law and how much was simply obeying guidelines. Rusty was at the helm. The old one-air pilot was diligently waiting for the captain's signal in order to back the engines and begin their journey upriver. You see they brought a boy aboard, Howie vented. Yep. Guidelines. The taciturn old man said the last word as though it explained everything. Do you reckon the captain took money for it? Rusty didn't respond. His eyes remained fixed on the emptying foredeck. I won't stand for it, continued Howie, and Rusty just smiled sadly in response, then shook his head. Howie heard the slap of the mooring lines being thrown back aboard. The captain's sharp whistle came, and Rusty pulled the cord on his larger steam whistle, which issued a loud vapour-filled groan to notify the engineer they were leaving. The Elysium's gears span in her guts, causing the paddle wheel to bite the river, pulling them away from the dock as the landing deck was winched up. Howie watched as Rusty span the wheel to twist the rudder so that, as the Elysium backed up, she turned sharply to point her nose upriver. Another blast of Rusty's steam whistle and the engineer reversed the flow of force from the engine so that the paddle wheel would drive them forwards towards their destination. The comfort he had once found in the loudness of the paddle wheel rang empty for Howie. He felt his brow fix into a frown as he thought over what could be done for the boy. He knew he had time, but not much of it, and Wanners were not permitted to restrict the Everfolk in any way. The frown stayed in place, as the wet warmth of the jungle became heavy around them, and the light from the sun became obscured by the overbearing trees that swooned from the banks to shade the river. Within the hour, they were swallowed by the jungle. They came for him in the night. Howie's one crewmates woke him up by forcing a gag in his mouth, and ropes looping around his hands and ankles. They carried him out of the cramped crew quarters and down the stairs. The brig such as it was, was below the water line and next to the hand pump the crew used to bring water up for the engine. The brig itself was just a brass rail they could bind someone to, should one of the crew lose themselves to drink a river malady or madness. Somewhere above him, the Everfolk were no doubt enjoying their last meal before their encounter with the heart of the jungle. Captain Hicks came down some time later, Likely after her presence was no longer required at the captain's table, she unhooked the gag from his mouth and sat opposite him, next to the stationary pump. Mutiny is a difficult concept to countenance. I know you've no respect for me as a sailor, but I think I can set you on a truer course. We are not just a crew aboard a ship. We are a floating funeral parlour. We do not get to decide who lives and who dies. Only that they transition from this world in the way the Everfolk see fit. That's the limit of our role in their lives. Hix, they don't know they're dying. They think they're ascending. That boy could travel to the outer planets and live a life like we could never dream of. 
Instead, it'll end for him as it does for the rest of the zealots that tire of eternal life. Poison and a whirlpool. I have seen the bones that escape the heart. Just splinters of the sticks that once held people up. So you say. Ask any river rat wanna. The guidelines say no kids. Because this is it for them. The end? What does it matter if it's the end? These are people that could live forever, but they choose to come to this place and undo what was done to them. They don't even think of you as human. To them you're something else. Lesser. The captain opened the lid on the pump, dipped her handkerchief in it and mopped at her brow and neck. They were near to the engine, parts of which grew so hot the metal would steal skin from incautious hands. Hicks came close enough so that if he'd wanted to, even whilst bound, he could have reached out and crushed her throat. I should have cut you in earlier. Then this could have all been avoided. There's still time, though, Howie. I'd hate to lose you. Don't think I haven't noticed how much you do around here. Cover the bribe for myself and the crew, and you can save the kid. We'll call it a clerical mix-up. You want to get paid twice to not kill a kid? Howie cut in, but the captain continued as though he'd not said a word. It was 10k all in. Have you got that kind of bank? In my pension. Have we got an accord? She flicked her belt knife open and held it loosely by her side. The threat was clear. She may as well have shoved the carrot up his ass whilst getting him to bite down on the stick. Yeah, we've an accord. At his words, she leant forwards and cut the ropes which held him to the rail. Make yourself presentable for the ceremony. Howie found himself walking back towards the crew quarters he had been burgled from. He passed some of the men that had woken him with rope and gag on his journey. Most of them had the decency to meet his sullen gaze. Howie quickly shaved, washed up with a small bowl of juddering water, and put on his dress uniform, affixing the last button just as Rusty's whistle sounded from the pilot house. Howie felt the Elysium begin to slow her progress in response and knew he was already late. By the time he made it up onto the dining balcony, the other folk were already at the railing. Beyond them, how he could see the night-drenched banks of the river were festooned with drooping branches, from which hung pendulous, iridescent blue flowers. His crewmates, better suited to balancing on the steamship than their ever folk masters, were leaning out with boat hooks to snag branches and bring them within easy reach of their rich guests as the Elysium progressed at a dawdling pace. Each of the Everfolk plucked their own plump little bouquet with delicate ceremony, and one by one brought them to where the captain was waiting next to a large and ornate copper bowl. How he could smell the hard alcohol base as he stood next to Hicks. The medicinal and sterile smells from the bowl warred in his nostrils against the fragrance of the blue jungle blooms the Everfolk dropped in it. Through each flower deposited, the captain stirred it once. How he had seen it many times, but had never cared much to watch the flowers disintegrate and imbue the liquid with its powerful essence before. Might I be excused, Captain? How he spoke gruffly, desperate to be away from the place. Do we have a problem? hissed Hicks. No, Captain. I just need to check that any debris this close to the bank doesn't snag up the paddle wheel. Hicks nodded barely containing her frown. How he undid the top button of his collar as he descended towards the boiler room, and ducking past the massive piston arms that powered the Elysium, leant over the rail next to the big wheel as it pushed effortlessly through the water. Are you well? The little voice startled him. How he turned to see where it had come from. Peering into the shadow, he realised an oil lamp had been extinguished. The Everfolk child stepped out of the darkness, and how he saw the sparkling galaxies of possibility in the boy's eyes. It was like looking into the face of a nascent god. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. How he replied formally, wishing he had left his collar buttoned. I noticed that you were uncomfortable with my presence aboard this junker, and I was hoping we might discuss an arrangement. The adult words sounded strange coming from such a little voice. 
My parents are devout believers in the holy portal they wish to pass through. I, young as I am, do not wish to die. I want to inherit their vast fortune and live my life. Will you aid me? Why did they bring you? Howie asked, and realised the child was waiting for the honorific, so he stuttered out a late, Sir! It was my idea to herd them towards it but it was beyond my comprehension that they would desire to never be parted from me in this manner. We live and learn, or at least I intend to. I can transfer you a million right now. The little boy brought out a sleek tablet and tapped at the dead screen, trying to wake it. Electricals don't work this close to the eye, sir. When you return me to dry land, then, yes? I could even take you into service if you wished it. Howie nodded. Less, sir, Hicks had said. Lesser. I will need to hear you say it, the child pressed. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. An hour later, Howie was back next to the captain as the river opened up before them. As it did, Rusty changed the Elysium's angle, and at a blast of the whistle, increased the speed of her paddle wheel. The Everfolk crowded the front rail and gasped to see the eye. The enormous whirlpool sparkled with the refracted moonlight which had found the meteorite shards that lay beneath its centre. The water spanned dizzyingly fast around that central point of sucking depth, and the Elysium chugged out into the churning water and began to circle with the current, nose pointed slightly away from the centre, and paddle wheel surging to keep them from being pulled in. The captain began the ceremony by sounding a gentle chime, signalling Howie to begin filling exquisite glasses from the ornate bowl. One by one, when they were ready, the Everfolk approached, and Howie handed each of them a glass of the flower-steeped draught they had helped prepare. He saw the child and his parents approach. They were amongst the last to be served. Howie handed each of the parents a glass before the child spoke. Is this one my flower? The boy pointed at one of the remaining glasses. No, sir. This one is yours. Howie reverentially passed over the glass, then smiled and nodded as he looked into the unfathomable eyes of the Everfolk child. The family, parents beaming beatifically, left together to stand by the railing. Deal's off, Howie muttered to the captain, who smirked knowingly and sounded the chime again. Each Everfolk drained their glass, and within a moment, they slithered to the floor as the poison undid their wealth-infused genetics and stopped their hearts. Howie watched the child drink his, watched him drop with a smug smile still on his face, and when the time came, Howie was the one to tip him over the side. He watched the boy get snatched by the current, along with the rest of his kind. Their belongings followed, after the crew had rifled through them for anything they could get away with stealing. All of it was eventually pulled inexorably towards the frothing centre of the eye of the jungle. Another blast of Rusty's steam whistle broke the pall of silence, and by the time Howie looked back at the water, the bodies and belongings had all been dragged out of sight. They made good time on the return leg. The Elysium pushed through the night down river, and before the next dusk could arrive, the home dock swung into view. Howie ran the crew ragged as they put the Elysium to sleep for the weekend, before eventually releasing them to the night, once he was satisfied she was prepared for the journeys they would make next week. The captain was already long gone by the time the work was done, so Howie signed the crew off the boat by the gangway and handed them their pay packets for shore leave. Rusty was the last to disembark, pocketing his thick envelope. Howie quickly extinguished the oil lantern he'd been working the ledger by and trotted after him. Rusty, he called out, causing the man to turn. Howie jabbed the old wanner with his right fist, seized him by the scruff of the neck, and then gave him two more good thumps on the side of his leathery face. The last one split his bushy eyebrow open. Howie dragged him close and spat words into his ear. Even think about tossing me overboard like that again, and you'll feel my fucking knife, old-timer. We got an accord. Aye, sir mumbled the old pilot through his rapidly swelling face. Howie let him drop to the dock and stalked past him. Jungle rum and grass awaited him with the other river rats, as it would for the rest of his life.
guidelines. Whatever way Knight looked at it, this one was pretty far from by the book. He reflected briefly on the fact that it probably depended on what side you were on, as the books didn't exactly line up. Stop! The rookie's voice was swallowed by the natural rumble of a city's rhythm. No other symphony like it, thought Knight. The bass rumble of the industry sphere a quarter mile beneath the metropolis. The garbled melody of a billion ads glowing as the night stars once had across every surface. Their voices selling everything from implant nodes that would let you visit the oceans that were, to simple pills that would keep your cock hard from dusk till dawn. Through it all, the choral murmur of trillions of lives packed in so tight, one of those pills might stop you fitting in your place. Stop! You're under arrest! The rookie's voice interrupted the planet's orchestral triumph once more, seemingly only for Knight's benefit. The kid really was doing it the way they taught you at the academy. Knight thought about telling her to save her breath. Son of a bitch can't hear you, and you'll want every drop of air you can get hold of to run one of these bastards down. But he couldn't spare it to yell, so settled on picking up the pace, drawing his sidearm as he did. The rookie wouldn't do that, he knew. Don't run with your firearm drawn. Keep that trigger under control. Yeah. Bullshit. That thing decides to stop running, you'll be glad that you have your weapon out. Half a second is everything. Of course, they don't teach you that at the academy. They show you how to put half a dozen in the ten ring, but the ten ring doesn't come screaming at you with a spear of holy light. At least it didn't when Knight was there. He'd let himself get distracted. Shit. Knight felt his instincts and the subdermal wiring that allowed him to take action faster than he could process the situation, threw him sideways into the rookie. A new cry of, You're under arrest! was cut short as he speared the breath out of her. Fifteen feet of illuminated ad boards smashed through the space they'd just been occupying. A number of civilians were ruined by the impact. The sign crowed on. With our patented blend of over 4,000 herbs and spices, you'll say, I can't believe it's not organic. Knight struggled to his feet. The years rubbed between his joints like grains of sand. It was an irritation now that he would have to pay for somewhere down the line. This was lost time that they couldn't afford. The rookie had pulled herself up and was moving towards the debris. The ad had finally started to blink out. Blood must have been getting into the exposed connections. We need to call this in, recover their ID nodes and contact their listed genetic associates. Knight blinked slowly, before turning to continue the foot chase. It was likely already a loss, but he couldn't just let it go. Either the rookie followed and got chewed out with him, or stayed and played by the rules as written. Either way, someone was going to be disappointed. The song of the city had undergone a key change. The groans of the crushed civilians faded into the miasmic swirl of sound around him. His heart rate, forced to kick into a new thudding staccato, became the leading instrument as blood flowed past his ear canals. He had to catch it. It was worth breaking a couple of laws. The commissioning body would write that off. They had before. As he ran, his tongue forced loose a tooth. It crunched between the others around it as he bit through its case. The pieces were sharp, and the taste that flooded his mouth was acrid. The lightning sensation of the plasmic infusion made him feel as though the planet beneath his feet was surging into him. The quintillion miles of wound neon on the planet's surface seemed for a moment to glow effervescent before it suddenly dimmed, throwing the world around it into sharp focus. Knight couldn't help but let out an exultant scream as he ploughed through the tide of bodies. 
Civilians were knocked sprawling as his enhanced form met scant resistance. And it didn't matter. His heart was rattling a military snare now. Had his mind been in the correct state, he may have checked his bio readout. But he didn't care what the rate was. Some asshole in a big chair would tell him what the reading had been when they chewed him out for saving the fucking world. He could see it back now. From here, it looked so... normal. Weak, even. From the front, he knew it would be beautiful. Astonishing was the word the rookie had used. The kid had studied the image of the perp for what seemed like an age to the impatient knight. All you needed to remember, from his perspective, was that it would look too beautiful to be real. Its mop of blonde hair, so fair it might be white, trailed behind it as it seemed to wind impossibly between the people. One of their tricks, to move among humankind as though they were simply atoms. That was enough confirmation it was the one. He could make the shot. He knew he could make the shot. The thing was right fucking there. Even as he ran, the crowd was beginning to part for him as the ripples of his movement spread out. He levelled his weapon. It reported just once, like the bellow of some ancient animal tearing from the shadows. It was a cataclysmic symbol hit at the end of the song. The city would need a moment to recover and turn the page on its sheet music. The shot had to be made. There was no second one, unless the rookie had followed. The universe held its breath in the silent wake following that explosive discharge. It snapped back into full life as the dusty grey explosion happened on the back of the perp. These rounds were far too rare now. Packed densely with the ashes of a religion that once was, they were well on their way to running out of the precious material. No more beams from holy sites or self-professed saints to burn. Its effect was immediate. The fleeing enemy slipped forward, given material form too fast for it to comprehend the change. As it stood, its broad wings unfurled. Even to a mind as twisted by chems as knights, they were magnificent to behold. A last vestige of their dominion over humanity. That air of dominance, the sense of smug surety that caused awe and concentric rings around the creature. It turned to lock eyes with night. Twelve feet of a body type humanity had long since abandoned. All sharp edges and flowing silk. The wings spread twice again as wide, and the people close to it found themselves compelled to press together, making space for the divine being that had slipped into their reality. Holy fuck! The rookie's voice sounded from behind him. Knight smiled to himself. If he could get this one to follow him again after their first experience with the Seraphim, they might just be able to make it in this division. You got that right, he said. Mikael, put your hands up. Fold them wings in and I will consider not blowing your fucking brains out. The Seraphim raised one hand towards the sky. As it drew a short semicircle above it in the air, the signs around it flickered, and a sword, shining like gold and writhing with serpents made of pale blue fire, seemed to be drawn from the very air. You may have abandoned the Lord, infant, but he is not dead. This world will be cleansed of its technological tumours, and Eden born anew. You are designed in his image, yet you abuse his work. Now die in his name. The seraphim seemed to cut through the air between them like a razor blade through gauze. Reality separating gently around it. Knight grinned. This was a song he definitely knew all the parts to. He resisted the urge to throw his gun away and fight the seraphim with his hands. He wanted to feel its blood pulse around his probing fingers. 
He wanted to hang it with its own guts. See what it looked like on its perfect insides. Night! The rookie called out, her brain finally catching up with the situation. Not enough implants. Not enough uppers. They were living in a world too slow for the fight that would be near done before they even registered it had started. As it closed, Knight spun the chamber on his sidearm. Three clicks. That was what he needed. Chamber one was empty now. The Saint's Ash round depleted. Four would be enough to give him a chance, while the rookie took the Academy's tear out of her mouth. The clicks seemed to come lifetimes apart as the gap was closed. The seraph's eyes shone golden as they locked onto the bloodshot orbs in Knight's skull. They strained as though to reach out and steal the angel's own gaze. It had them working in concert with every other fibre of his body. His muscles pulled against his bones. Some of them would already be separating. The dose had been truly massive. It had needed to be. The third click came just as contact happened. Knight dropped to one knee with a shuddering impact as the great flaming sword swept through the space his head had been in. His left hand shot out like a bolt of vengeful lightning, gripping the enemy by its slender ankle. His right brought the gun up and let loose the chambered round. The gun bellowed, but the sound was no mere crash of explosive force. Instead, it called with Knight's own booming voice. All of his malice and conviction poured into it. Thou shalt not kill! The round itself was so simple. A casing of pure silver was the most expensive part. Their synthesized silver was no different from the ore of times past, and it added insult to the injury. Inside, bound tightly, was a strip of flesh from Knight's body. Even as he fired it, he felt the wound again, as though it were opened anew. It soon would be, if he survived the fight. The flesh was carved in tiny, intricate script, an ancient dead language called Hebrew. It spelt out ten simple rules that these assholes had set some time in the distant past. This idiot had broken one of them, smashing a sign through at least a dozen bystanders definitely counted as a sin, and that meant Knight had him. There was no spurt of blood or great wrenching of the body as pain racked it. Instead, chains of light sprung from the impact wound and bound the angel tightly. Not tight enough to kill, that would be far too ironic, but tight enough to buy ample time to deal with it. At least, sometimes. Knight sprung up, uncoiling like a deadly viper. As he came, that voice, so pure and yet so sickening, seemed to pulse through him again. You would turn my words against me, sinner, but you are not worthy to cast any stone. Your whole being is sin, animal. I will render you incapable of speech and of sight. I will take from you the very essence of what gives you form and leave your memories to drift eternal in the pit of my fallen brother Lucifer. I am Mikael. I am war. I am your end. Night collided hard with the thing's midriff. The chains clanked against his shoulder and began to scorch as he made contact. Time. He didn't have much time. With a great lurch, both of them toppled groundwards. Knight's weight pressed the ethereal form into the ground painfully. He roared again. A mix of expletives in a dozen languages flew out of him, laced with blood and traces of spent chem. It dripped onto the perfect naked chest of Mikael, leaving strange pink splotches in the air above him. They couldn't get dirty. On the outside. Knight brought a hand up and grabbed desperately at the angel's face. One finger found what would be an eye and pressed hard, eliciting a scream from the creature. His gloves 
woven through as they were with threads of ancient papal robes, had done their job. He could breach the thing. He pushed as hard as his quickly deconstructing muscles would allow and felt something give. He dragged his other arm out from under his foe and lifted it in an effort to drag himself closer and put the clutched pistol under its chin. The sensation was white hot. Not pain, but something beyond it. It was what the overdose was to a chem addict. A moment beyond a normal sensation into something you knew there was no return from. Mikhail had managed to partially free its arm and deftly swept its blade through Knight's moving right forearm. It did not bleed, but he felt snakes of blue fire writhe through his veins. The sword pulsed in his vision as Black Spot swam to join it, consciousness abandoning him. He threw his head back and vomited heartily. It caught in the awkward angle of his throat and he felt death begin to tighten his coils. He tossed his head around to try and loose the discharged contents of his stomach, and saw the rookie dumbly lifting his entire forearm and the weapon it held. He ached to choke forth words, but his body was betraying him. He felt the voice of Mikael reverberate in him once more. There, there, child. Here, let me take you to meet him that you may have peace in your final moments. Mikhail reached and touched his sword hand to Knight's face. It was as if every drug he had ever taken was poured into him in its purest form. He gazed upon the incomprehensible in that moment. It was purest white light, and yet it did not burn his eyes. Throatless voices called wordless songs, softly and eternally, there was nothing he could recognise here, including the sensation of peace. Mikael stood before him, a soft smile playing on his face. He looked deep into Knight's eyes and wore nothing but a look of concerned love. An older brother, perhaps, only doing what was best by an erstwhile infant. Knight leant in and clamped his teeth around the bastard's nose. He bit as hard as he could, grinding his jaws back and forth as though to separate the breathing apparatus from his deadly foe's face. Unbidden, the angel elicited another scream, and reality snapped back in. It brought with it all the agony of Knight's existence, the come down racking him near as hard as the flames that ate him from within. He spat the wad of flesh he'd severed from the perfect face, and roared his last defiance at the rookie. Chamber six! Ada spun the chambers on her partner's gun. She cursed her inexperience as she was forced to check the markings to line up the correct shot. It seemed to take an age before she could level the weapon and, point blank, release the round into Mikhail's head. She didn't know what sort of ammunition her near-dead partner had been using, but she knew she'd have as much luck with her own gun if she tried to seduce the thing. She was surprised when no sound emanated from the weapon. Instead, a ring of black energy, almost like light in reverse, circled its head. Night began to laugh, the keening, mad laugh of one on the precipice of death. His eyes, Ada saw, turned black, and then he burst into flames, all that same colour. That round was affectionately known to the older officers as the do or die round. Of course, it would be more accurately described as die, then do. It paid, they'd reckoned, to play both sides. The big boys, so their contact had told them, could only be dragged to hell by a demon of high power or one of their most wrathful, sin-filled servants. The contract had been snapped up as soon as Knight's gun had offered it, witnessed, as they all must be, by an angel. With a roar and a wave of black flames, both Mikael and the stricken warrior cop disappeared. Ada slumped to the ground and let the junky lunatic's gun fall, clattering the final beats of his city song as it went. Operations? 
she said softly. I think we got him. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?